<laughs> VOA when it hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Novak and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... A new report by a British-based plant protection group says almost 30% of the world's tree species are at risk of extinction. The State of the World's Trees report warns that 17,500 tree species are at risk of dying out, and 440 species have fewer than 50 individual trees left in the wild. The report was recently published by Botanic Gardens Conservation International. The number of threatened tree species is double the number of threatened mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles combined, the report said. In a statement, BGCI Secretary General Paul Smith said, This report is a wake-up call to everyone around the world that trees need help. Among the most at-risk trees are species including magnolias and dipterocarps. These trees are commonly found in Southeast Asian rainforests. Oak trees, maple trees, and ebonies also face threats, the report said. Trees help support the natural environment and are considered important for fighting global warming and climate change. The extinction of a single tree species could mean the loss of many others. Every tree species matters to the millions of other species that depend on trees and to people all over the world, Smith said. The report found that thousands of kinds of trees in the world's top six countries for tree species diversity are at risk of extinction. The greatest single number is in Brazil, where 1,788 species are at risk. The other five countries are Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Colombia, and Venezuela. The report said the top three threats facing tree species are crop production, logging, and livestock farming. Climate change and extreme weather are also growing threats. At least 180 tree species are directly threatened by rising seas and severe weather, the report added. It noted that island tree species are more at risk than other trees. This is particularly concerning because many islands have species of trees that can be found nowhere else, the report said. Have you ever made eye contact with a robot? It can be a very strange experience. Scientists even have a name for the feeling. The Uncanny Valley. Now, researchers at the Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia, or IIT, in Italy, have found that it is more than just a feeling. They ran an experiment that showed how a robot's gaze 
can trick people into thinking they are socially interacting with a human being. That experience can slow a person's ability to make decisions. Gaze is an extremely important social signal that we employ on a day-to-day -day basis when interacting with others, said Professor Agnieszka Wikowska. She is the lead writer of a study on the research that recently appeared in the publication Science Robots. The question is whether the robot gaze will evoke very similar mechanisms in the human brain as another human's gaze would, Vikowska told Reuters. The team asked 40 people to play a video game of chicken. In the game, each player has to decide whether to permit a car to drive straight toward another car or to turn to avoid a crash. The people were playing against a human-like robot sitting across from them. During breaks in the game, players had to look at the robot. Sometimes the robot would look back, and other times it would look away. As the interactions happened, the scientists collected data on behavior and brain activity. Our results show that, actually, the human brain processes the robot gaze as a social signal, and that signal has an impact on the way we're making decisions, on the strategies we deploy in the game, and also on our responses, Vikowska said. The gaze of the robot affected decisions by delaying them, so humans were much slower in making the decisions in the game, she added. The findings could be useful in helping to decide where and how human-like robots might be placed in the future. When it is understood when and how robots change social behavior, then we can decide which sort of context this is desirable and beneficial for humans, and in which context this should not occur, Fikowska said. I'm Dan Novak. You may have heard the term metaverse to describe a new virtual world that many technology companies aim to develop. What are some of the goals of this planned world, and how might it change our lives? The word is a combination of the prefix meta, which means beyond, and verse, which relates to the universe. The term appeared in the 1992 science fiction book Snow Crash by writer Neil Stevenson. In his story, people wore virtual reality headsets to interact inside a game-like technology world. Metaverse describes a non-physical world in which individuals can interact through different kinds of virtual technology. For example, a metaverse could permit people living on different sides of the world to meet up through technology and virtually go on a vacation, play sports, or work together on projects. People linked to the metaverse would be connected at all times and physical distance would not limit their ability to interact. The main technologies that would drive such a world would be virtual reality, or VR, and augmented reality, AR. 
Other yet-to-be-invented technologies would likely also be used to improve experiences within the metaverse. One of the biggest fans of a proposed metaverse has been Facebook chief Mark Zuckerberg. He has spoken over the years about how such a world would fit in with his company, a massive social media service with international reach. Facebook has backed the idea by investing a lot of money in VR and AR technologies, including the development of headsets that promise to create the most realistic virtual interactions possible. The company also announced in July that it had created a new team to specifically develop metaverse products. Earlier this year, Zuckerberg called the metaverse the next generation of the Internet and next chapter for us as a company. He said the plans would create entirely new experiences and economic opportunities. Google has also been developing VR and AR tools that aim to bridge the digital and physical worlds. One of its latest tools is called Google Lens. It enables users to use a device's camera to capture an object. The technology then uses image recognition and Google's search system to describe what the object is and provide information about it. Such a system could one day be used with headsets in a metaverse. Apple has also reportedly been working on the development of AR smart glasses that could launch as soon as next year. And in May, Microsoft explained how it was developing a series of metaverse apps designed to help business users of its Azure cloud computing service combine virtual and physical elements. With the help of augmented reality glasses, individuals might be able to see a wealth of information pass before their eyes while moving around in a city. This could include traffic and pollution data, information on the natural environment, or local history. However, most predictions for a future metaverse see the technology going much further. These include the ability for people to be transported to digital settings that feel very real, such as a nightclub, a sports stadium, or a mountaintop. A metaverse environment might look a lot like many of the online video games that are popular today. These involve players around the world interacting in virtual environments and even permit users to buy digital items with real money. Kathy Hackel is a technology expert who advises companies on the metaverse. She told the French press agency AFP that the younger generation is much more willing to attach real meaning to virtual experiences and objects. One example she gave would be a musical performance. My first concert was in a stadium. My son's first concert was American rapper Lil Nas X on the gaming system Roblox, Hackle said. Just because it happened in Roblox it didn't make it less real for him, she added. I'm Brian Lynn.
from VOA Learning English. Welcome to The Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. John Quincy Adams was sworn in as President of the United States on March 4, 1825. A big crowd came to the Capitol building for the ceremony. All the leaders of government were there, senators, congressmen, Supreme Court justices, and James Monroe. Monroe's two terms as president were ending. President-elect Adams focused his inaugural address on unity. Adams said the Constitution and the representative democracy of the United States had proved a success. The nation was free and strong and stretched across the continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific. He noted that during the past 10 years, political party differences had eased. So now, he said, it was time for the people to settle their differences and make a truly national government. Adams closed his speech by recognizing that he was a minority president. No candidate had received a majority of electoral votes. So the House of Representatives had to make the decision. The House chose Adams as the next president. He told the crowd gathered at the Capitol that he needed the help of everyone in the years to come. Presidents-elect used to give their inaugural address before their swearing-in. So after his speech, John Quincy Adams took the oath of office that made him the sixth president of the United States. His father was John Adams, the second president. John Quincy's mother, Abigail, made sure he received an excellent education. Historian Harlow Giles Unger wrote a biography of John Quincy Adams. Quincy, incidentally, is how the family pronounced it. The historian tells this story about Abigail Adams and her son in 1775 in Massachusetts during the Revolutionary War. When her firstborn son, John, John Quincy uh, was about was seven. Uh, they heard the uh, cannon fire in the distance. They went up to the top of the hill behind the, their farmhouse and could look across uh, Boston Harbor and see the Battle of Bunker Hill. And she took her boy by the hand. They went back down to the house, and she started melting down the family pewter uh, with uh, John Quincy helping her uh, and making musket balls for the American <laughs> Uh, revolutionary troops. Abigail and John Adams were strong patriots. They were one of the founding families of America. Harlow Giles Unger says Abigail Adams raised John Quincy to serve his country. She told uh, her son that if, if you do not grow up uh, to be a, a great leader of this country, it will be because of your own laziness and obstinacy. Uh, she and her husband, John Adams, at that point decided to raise their son to be uh, the president of the United States. As a boy, John Quincy Adams learned to speak at least four languages and read Greek and Latin. He studied Shakespeare's plays. He traveled in Europe. He worked with his father in American consulates and embassies. He graduated from Harvard and was working as a lawyer by the age of 23. He was a brilliant, brilliant young boy and man. For about 25 years, Adams held mostly appointed jobs. He was ambassador to the Netherlands, Germany, Russia, 
and Britain. He helped lead the negotiations that ended the War of 1812 between Britain and the United States. And he served eight years as Secretary of State. Adams spent most of his career working in public service. Harlow Giles Unger says he could be impatient, especially with lawmakers. He despised uh, most of the politicians he met in Congress because he found them to be ignorant and self-serving uh, with no sense of patriotism and sense of obligation to the nation. John Quincy Adams did not care for political battles. When he became president, he tried to bring his political opponents and the different parts of the country together in his cabinet. His opponents, however, refused to serve. And although his cabinet included Southerners, he did not really have the support of the South. In his first message to Congress, President Adams described his ideas about the national government. The chief purpose of the government, he said, was to improve the lives of the people it governed. To do this, he offered a national program of building roads and canals. He also proposed a national university and a national scientific center. Adams said Congress should not be limited only to making laws to improve the nation's economic life. He said it should make laws to improve the arts and sciences, too. Many people of the West and South did not believe that the Constitution gave the federal government the power to do all these things. They believed that these powers belonged to the states. Their representatives in Congress rejected Adams' proposals. Harlow Giles Unger says some of the disagreements during Adams' presidency helped start the American Civil War more than 30 years later in 1861. The country was now splitting. Uh, the South, most of the South, had never accepted the Constitution as such. The Constitution did away with state sovereignty, but many Americans never accepted that, and especially in the South. The political picture in the United States began to change during the administration of John Quincy Adams. His opponents won control of both houses of Congress in the elections of 1826. Adams' opponents called themselves Democrats. They supported Andrew Jackson and wanted him to win the next presidential election. Democrats needed the support of both the West and the South to elect Jackson. So they proposed a bill that appeared to help the West. The bill involved import taxes. A number of Western states wanted duties on industrial goods imported from other countries. The purpose was to protect their own industries. Southern states, however, opposed the import duties. They produced no industrial goods that needed protection. They argued that the Constitution did not give the government in Washington the right to approve such taxes. The Democrats expected Congress to defeat the bill they proposed. They thought the West would be grateful that the Democrats had tried to help them, and the South would be happy that there would be no import taxes. But to the Democrats' surprise, many congressmen from the Northeast joined with lawmakers from the West to support the bill. They did so even though the bill would harm industries in the Northeast. The Northerners 
wanted to keep the idea of protective trade taxes alive. The bill passed in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. This left President Adams with a difficult decision. Should he sign it into law or should he veto it? If he signed the bill, it would show he believed that the Constitution allowed protective duties. That decision would create even more opposition to him in the South. If he vetoed it, then he would lose support in the West and Northeast. Adams signed the bill, but he made clear that Congress was fully responsible for it. Democrats in Congress made other attempts to weaken support for Adams. For example, they claimed that he was misusing government money. They tried to show that he and his father before him had become rich from government service. Others accused him of giving government jobs to his supporters. This charge was false. Top administration officials had urged Adams to give government jobs only to men who were loyal to him. But Adams had refused. He felt that as long as someone had done nothing wrong, he should continue in his job. During his four years as president, Adams removed 12 people from government jobs. In each case, the person had failed to do his work or had done something criminal. Adams often gave jobs to people who did not support him politically. He believed it was wrong to give a person a job just for political reasons. Many of Adams' supporters could not understand. They had worked hard to get him elected. Their support for him cooled. Historian Harlow Giles Unger says John Quincy Adams was never able to meet the high expectations many had for him. His presidency was a complete failure. He was able to accomplish nothing. The political battle between Adams' Republican Party and Jackson's Democrats remained bitter. Perhaps the worst fighting took place in the press. Each side had its own newspaper for support. The Daily National Journal supported the administration. The United States Telegraph supported Andrew Jackson. At first, the pro-administration newspaper called for national unity and an end to personal attacks. Then things changed. The paper had to defend against charges of political wrongdoing within Adams' party. It needed to turn readers away from these problems. So it printed a pamphlet that had been used against Andrew Jackson during an election campaign. The pamphlet accused Jackson of many bad things. The most damaging part involved the wife of another man. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.